What you're about to see is a 14-year-old make an articulate case for why public school is a problem. Watch all the way to the end because this one's eye-opening. All right, folks, I'm not going to delay any further. I want you to watch this video as soon as we are finished playing it. You need to stay tuned because I can tell you this. What you're going to hear is eye-opening. According to a chart on Chippewa Valley School's own website, every single teacher in the district is making well over $100,000 per year. So is every counselor, principal, media specialist? Media specialist, yeah. Yeah, the guy that puts a post on Facebook uh, maybe once every two weeks. Yeah, that's who we're talking about. That's the media specialist. No joke. 100K a year. 100K, folks. Think we got a problem yet? All right, we'll let her continue. Director, coordinator, and supervisor. It seems the only ones not making over $100,000 are the lunch ladies. At the November meeting, I outed Superintendent Robert's salary for of almost $400,000, which is nearly as much as the U.S. president. With these types of salaries, parents should expect extremely high proficiency scores and academic excellence. But that's not the case. More money does not equal better education. Proficiency scores are as low as 20% in this district. Chippewa Valley High School is ranked 384th out of 735 Michigan high schools. In 2018, your average standard score was 59.42, but went down to 21.68 last year. Your Michigan State percentile is only 18%, meaning 82% of Michigan students scored better on standardized tests than those at Chippewa Valley. You have a one-star rating on the largest school evaluation website, and you're failing your special needs students too. Their score is only 12, and their Michigan State percentile is now only 3.4% which is zero stars on the rating website. Some of you have been on this board for years and things have gotten worse in this district. One thing has remained unchanged since 2011, and that's Mr. Roberts being superintendent. Every parent in this district should be asking this board, why is Mr. Roberts still the superintendent here? Another question is, why is Mr. Roberts running these board meetings? Why is he blocking and controlling information to a board member? He's not a member of this board. Things have gotten really con convoluted here and boundaries have been crossed. The school board is the governing body of the school district and Mr. Roberts is only an advisor to this board. Mr. Pearl, as board president, it's actually your job to preside over and conduct these meetings not the superintendents. Mr. Roberts should not even be speaking unless giving a report on district issues or if a question is posed to him. And he definitely does not have the authority to control information or access or ban specific board members from anything. So, Mr. Pearl, why are you allowing the superintendent to usurp your authority at these meetings? Maybe you shouldn't be the board president. It's no wonder this district is failing. You can't even conduct a school board meeting correctly. It's a new year now and time for a new direction for this board. Put student academic success at your priority and start following proper procedures and rules for these meetings. Thank you. They're never gonna put student academic success at the top priority. Most public schools will never do that for a lot of reasons, and we're going to get into that in just a second. When we talk about education and we talk about God's intent for children to be educated, God's intent for children to be educated was to be educated by their parents, was to be able to receive the education that they needed by people that have their best interests at heart. And the thing that's really interesting here is that we have tons and tons of teachers that are in the public school environment, who are radically awesome, wonderful, great, powerful influences in the lives of a lot of our children. Good influences because they're fighting the good fight, they're representing the God of their fathers, and they are trying to stand up for righteousness, but they are terribly overwhelmed. 
And the problem, and by the way, when I say overwhelmed, let me make myself clear. Not overwhelmed in the lack of resources, although there is a lack of resources. Not overwhelmed in some of the uh, uh, typical things that you hear people oftentimes talk about or capitulate concerning in order to get more funding for education. Overwhelmed in that they're not being allowed to tell their students the truth. As a matter of fact, their hands are being forced in brainwashing students. And every single day, these amazing teachers put their livelihoods at risk in order to make sure these kids don't get brainwashed. But here's the problem. When you look at the intent for these schools even starting, oh yes, you could go back and you could look at the beginning of any type of a schooling system as early as the 1600s when you get into the history here in the United States of America. But the reality of it is, I want people to understand this because this is like super, super critical, okay? I want people to understand that when you look at education and its real inception, where it really started beginning to have a major influence and laws begin to come into place, which made children get their education, we go back to the time of Rockefeller. We go back to the time of Carnegie. And these people spent tons of money in having their hands influencing how our children are educated because they had an intent in wanting to cause their minds to be brainwashed to produce what they wanted to produce. And what they wanted to produce was factory workers and what they wanted to produce were people who would be mindless in the work that they do and they have been very successful in doing it. Look, think about it like this, folks. When a child goes to school, do they work for six hours? Yes, and then they're given an additional two hours worth of homework. The idea is it resembles an eight-hour day. And if you want a few little extra brownie points, then what you'll do is you'll work a few extra hours to get into an AP class or something like that. And the whole idea is to mimic the behavior of what you might see in a factory or what you might see in some kind of an employment structure. Kids from a very young age are taught to put in their eight hours and then go out and play. That's exactly what they're taught. And the reality of it is they're not being given the correct message. So much so that if you even look at the way they process kids, and I hate using that term, but they process kids in these school environments. They have massive amounts of kids that get together. One teacher who's their master, who pretty much speaks to them everything that they must learn. And what they must learn becomes so rudimentary that even the very basics of what anybody should be learning becomes very difficult when you start getting into the older ages. Why? Because they want to minimize their ability to be able to understand education. They want to minimize their ability to be able to grow and learn and to become excellent. The reality of it is, they want to get kids from a very young age programmed and brainwashed into thinking that they what they are doing is normal so that when they get older and they graduate out of high school, they will be used to putting in the eight-hour day. They will be used to going in and doing exactly that. And parents, think about this for just one second. If you like the idea of sending your children to public school, fine, no problem. I'm not going to even get in your face over that. I'm really not going to say much. But just understand what's going on. Understand that for roughly six to eight hours of your day, you're sleeping, right? Six to eight hours. And then another three or four hours, you're doing other things that don't involve activity with your children, even though your children might be present. So you only have maybe three or four quality hours a day during a weekday with your children and an overwhelming majority of that time is them extending themselves into their tasks, their responsibilities, their homework, and everything else. Homework was designed by these people in order to keep your children's minds preoccupied and being led by the things that they in, literally ingrain in them during the school day so that you as a parent will have less time influencing them. Think of it like this. You send your child to public school, you're allowing your child to be influenced and brainwashed by somebody for eight hours at a bare minimum when you yourself only have a couple of hours a day with them. Think about that for just one second. Think about how backwards and how brainwashing that is. And if that isn't enough for you, let's talk about where the popularity of public schools really started happening. It was in the Industrial Revolution, and things really began to change right around the year 1914, when Rockefeller, John Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, really started getting involved in the investment 
of schools and education because they knew they needed more people for their factories. They knew they needed to condition the younger generation in order to keep the older generation where they needed to be. God's intent for education was that children would be educated by their parents. And as children were educated by their parents, they would develop skills. They would develop family uh, secrets and understanding concerning a trade they may be good at, whatever it might be. And they would grow together in it. And with each passing generation, they grow wealthier and they have a more comfort in the things that they do and learn how to pass those equitable skills down from generation to generation, making contributions to people all around them and eventually around the whole world. Well, this, what we're seeing right now is designed to do exactly the opposite of it. And we are watching it come into complete fruition where now the school system is being used to brainwash children into not even believing that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. That's exactly what we're getting into. But look at this, $129 million in 1914. That is a lot of money, folks. $129 million was spent just by Rockefeller alone to develop a board of education that would have a, just a radically powerful influence in the things that were being given to these kids. As a matter of fact, let me read a few quotes to you because this is really interesting. Let me read a quote by a man named Frederick T. Gates. He was an advisor to Rockefeller who pretty much ran the board of education once it had started. Let me read a quote to you. This is what he said. He said, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. He goes on to say this. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or men of science. We have not to raise up from among them authors, editors, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists uh, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen of whom we have ample supply. It's about Thusian. This is insane, you guys. I mean, this is what their purpose was. It is definitely Thomas Malthus all over again. This is the time, by the way, when Margaret Sanger was at the height of her influence beginning to develop. It's these type of people that have no regard for mankind, and we are witnessing this verbatim coming into its full fruition in the day in which we live. That's exactly the world in which we're living, guys. And it's actually really, really, really ugly. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. There were reports even at that time, right, that Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie played a significant role to influence the American educational agenda. They, they were already concerned about it. As a matter of fact, the National Education Association, alarmed by the activity of these guys, actually made this statement in their annual meeting. They said, we view with alarm the activity of Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations, agencies not in any way responsible to the people in their efforts to control the policies of our state educational institutions to fashion after their conception and standardize our courses of study and to surround the institutions with conditions which menace true academic freedom and defeat the primary purpose of democracy as heretofore preserved in violate in our common schools, normal schools, and university. And here's the eye-opening aspect of all of this. The vision of Carnegie and the vision of Rockefeller has become a reality today. We are literally in a place where our public school system has become the greatest tool for conditioning the minds and the hearts of our kids, and our kids are being lost to what we are seeing happening in these school systems. It has created a culture of people who are not accountable. When you look at these $100,000 here, $400,000 there for this board uh, uh, superintendent, so on and so forth, this is indicative of the world that is being raised up in academia. You pay these massive salaries for people that aren't making a real difference, and what they're in essence doing is maintaining the status quo for the purpose of keeping funding where it needs to be and kind of keeping the engine moving. That's their job. Their job isn't to educate. Their job isn't to innovate. Their job is to keep the oil in the machine, to make the machine continue to produce factory workers. And right now, it has gotten worse because we are in the last days. And in these days, it is taking these children and destroying their minds and their hearts. Folks, it is time to wake up. It is time to pay attention to the reality of what we're seeing. The world is changing quickly. Parents, take charge of the education of your children. Stand up 
for your children. If you're in a position where the only option you have is to send them to public school, invest a ton of time in them. Be curious. Figure out what are they saying? What are they doing? What's happening? What are the teachers teaching them? Talk to them. I would say sacrifice whatever you can to homeschool them because that's where you're going to win the war. That's where the battle is going to be won. It is time for us to take a stand for our children. If we don't invest in the future generation now, we're going to lose them, folks, and we're already losing them. It is time to open up your eyes and remember the fact that you have the opportunity to be the most influential person in your child's life. They need you to be that person, so it's time to live up to it. Let's get into this, folks. God has given us the obligation as parents to take that stand and if you are not a parent, or you're not married yet, or you're in one of these situations where you find yourself without children and you're single, help us stay in this battle. Find a parent that you can be helpful to. Give support to people that are struggling in this area. Do whatever you can to jump into the battle for our future, the battle for the souls of our children. It's a worthwhile fight, you guys. Let's get in it. God bless you.